This is a Stock Train Reality Podcast, episode 84. And knowing that everybody's different, I have to figure out what's good for me. Because I hear, you know, in your in your, um, in your your videos, you know, it's like, well, this works for somebody, but this doesn't necessarily work for everybody. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host. On the topic of kids and video games, please don't get them started. Oh, whoops. Play Trader. Now, I promise this was not put in a place. This was totally random, but it seems the stars have aligned. But in our interview, as you're going to see, our, our guest is a, a video gamer, likes to play games. And so now I'm about to rant here on this topic. So hopefully Tim, our guest, doesn't fall into this situation. But kids and video games, I don't have anything against video games. I used to play them. But there's this thing called the outdoors. And the outdoors has all kinds of good stuff out there. You can scrape your knees. You can get splinters. You can build stuff. You can get exercise. So if you really ever want to just send me off, just talk to me about this day and age with kids and video games. And I... I could do a whole podcast on this very topic. So, um, Chaz, I know you're a gamer, but obviously we've had many discussions where when you were a kid, I know you got outside plenty. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, any thoughts on the matter in a condensed version? Because obviously I don't want this to turn into a big rant, but I'll just, I, I the will. floor is yours. I, as I've gotten older, I, and actually just recently, I used to, well, actually, I played a lot of video games for you know a couple hours a day at least, um, especially at night. That was just my way of unwinding. But now, at the age of 27, um, I actually just bought another skateboard, and it's like I'm reliving my youth. And I skateboarded for like nine years when I was younger, but that always kept me outside doing something. So I just bought another one in an effort to kind of get away from the computer, to let that be my way to unwind. I take the dog. We go flying around the block and stuff like that. So yes, the outdoors is by far vastly superior, and it's fun to get hurt and fall and do stuff and kind of see things in the world because... Um, I stared at a computer screen enough, and I'm not saying video games aren't fun and a great way to relieve stress, you know, especially if the weather is kind of not good or something like that. But um, yeah, the outdoors is just so much superior than video games. Yeah, so I'm not turning this into a, a parenting podcast, but just it, it, kids outdoors, it does a body good, and we'll just leave it at that. I kind of already alluded to our guest today is Tim. He's a member of the chat room. In the chat room, he goes by Early Dog, D A W G, and um, I guess we'll learn where that screen name comes from, and that kind of prompts the whole little video game discussion there. But uh, like I said, kind of funny timing that this fun fact just happened to line up with uh, you know when that popped up in the conversation. But um, man with a plan is just how I would really summarize this. Uh, Tim is uh, he's taking things serious. I'll leave it at that. I don't want to offer any spoilers, but if this guy isn't taking it serious, then I don't know what serious looks like. And like I said, I'll leave it at that. Let's just get started with Tim. Well, hey, Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I've, I'm honored and uh, it's a pleasure. Now, I have to ask you, early dog, D-A-W-G, is what your alias is in the chat room. Is there any yes. history behind that or, I mean, enlighten it's, us? Yeah, it's my uh, it's my gamer name. So uh, a- any game I play, if you see that, that's probably me. But so uh, you say- I'm down to like one game now. So <laughs> so when you say game, are you talking like uh, Monopoly and Sorry? Or are you talking like no. Call of Duty and stuff like that? No, I, I used to play a lot of those war games, but uh, I'm pretty much just a clasher now. I play Clash of Clans, and that's pretty much it. Is that one, time, of, those cell, is that one, of, is that one of those cell phone ones that like you always see commercials for on TV, like with Arnold and stuff like that? Uh, it, it's, it's like that. You could play it on your cell phone, iPad, yeah, device. It's a device game. Chaz, you would, I should leave any sort of video game questions up to you since you have a little bit more experience, but I guess this is not a, a video game podcast. So anyways, no, Tim, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's just, uh, I guess, get right into it. Where did this whole kind of journey start for you? What got you interested in the markets? And uh, we'll see where the breeze takes us. Well, my first introduction was uh, through my father-in-law years ago. When my wife and I first got married, he used to show me all these uh, newsletters that he used to get. And uh, my wife one day, because I wasn't like really interested in playing some of these these stocks that he was talking about, you know, you, you never hear about them on the news. The, 
basically they were penny stocks. And uh, she gave me, uh, she said, here, I want you to take $500 and I want you to invest it in the stock that my dad's telling you to invest in. And I said, you realize I'm going to use a match and light this $500 up, right? You prepared for that? And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared for that. So I did. I bought some, uh, I don't know how many shares, whatever, $500 at about 20 cents a share would get me uh, through some broker in Vancouver market and uh, bought an oil and gas company, let it let it triple, sold it, and uh, that was it. That was, that was about 20 years ago, and I really haven't done much since until about a year ago, my wife signed herself up with a... Uh, broker got into those penny stock things again and pretty much lost everything she invested in it and I said well you know this is this is something we need to do uh, because my my personal life is I, we have six kids here and it's like I don't see them uh, because of my work schedule I don't see the kids they go to school when I'm asleep I get home they're all in bed um except on the weekends is when I see them. So I, I said, we need to get to where I can get some kind of income other than going to work every day. And so I started, you know, about a year ago, Googling, looking around on the internet. And I've always had an interest in the stock market. I, I did work uh, as a financial planner slash advisor for a while. So I've had an interest there, but it not – in this type of investing where we're dealing with equities, just more of mutual fund investing and helping others do that. So now I want to, I want to circle back before you go any further. Sure. So, so I'm confused. So you, you trade this penny stock, which you think is not going to go anywhere. You literally triple it. And I'm, I'm surprised right there that you weren't like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing this over and over again. What led you to kind of take a break from, you know, 20 years back to, to now? Well, I, <clears throat> I was uh, self-employed at the time. I needed to focus on my business uh, generate income. We were having kids and, you know, little kids in the house, moms at home. So it, it was just too risky. And when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, I don't have, uh, that kind of money to, to make that work. Plus there was no, uh, the thing that really bothered me was there was no access to that market that other than newsletters that are already, you know, somebody wrote that article two weeks ago, published it and mailed it out. It's, it's old data by the time you get it. Um, I didn't want to pay a broker to start investing in the, you know, Dow Jones industrial average type stocks. So I didn't have that kind of uh, capital to work with. So it was just a matter of, you know, let's just focus on life. Let's just get our business going. Let's just, you know, pay the bills, so to speak. So, so it's been oh. a it's been a little bit of a ride that way. Now, was this whole time you're holding it? Because I, I fully echo Ches. You, you know, you mentioned you know you wanted to focus on your business, generate income. In my mind, it's well, you just freaking tripled your money. I mean, is there any better way to generate income than that? So, is it safe to say that this whole time you were holding that penny stock, were you just like, this is so shady? What is going on? This is just going to absolutely blow up in my face at any time. Because um, I, I, it's just, it's amazing. Because most people we talk to. If that would happen to them, they'd be like, let's go load up the account with that much more money and let's ride. So you, I mean, Chaz, I think, I feel like this may be the first time ever. And we are well over 80 episodes in where we had a guest just not, you know, have something good happen. And then all of a sudden just say kind of peace out. Yeah. I was going to say they're usually skeptical, but, um, he actually had to go completely in his favor, which is rare. And then, you know, he's still skeptical about it. So yeah, definitely it has not happened in the past 80 episodes. So I, I guess, yeah, that's a very unique twist. And that's why I love this podcast, because this is definitely a first. So, um, I mean, but were you pretty much super kind of almost weirded out the whole time? Like, what is going on? I just want to get out of this. Well, you, you know, it was one of those, I have to call the broker every week. What's the price at today? Oh. You yeah. know, because again, there was no, I mean, this is like before the, the internet craze. Uh, we're, we're talking early, early nineties. And, uh, it, it was just, there was no access. So I didn't know what was happening with the stock where I could watch the news and I could tell you what, you know, uh, 
the big companies are doing, but you can't see what's happening with the this little company. It wasn't in the paper, you know, it's over the counter, so it's just not something I was super comfortable with. And I was doing it more for my wife's benefit than I was for mine. And uh, I, to be honest with you, when I when I called the broker and he said, eh, it's at this price, and I, I'm like tripling my money, I said, sell it all, you know. I said, hey, honey, I, I sold all the stock and I, you know, I tripled our money. And she said, what? My dad said it was going to go even higher. And I said, I don't care what your dad says. I, I just tripled your money. <laughs> and she got kind of upset with me that I bailed out. So I, I continued to follow it, uh, you know, my, with my weekly calls. And it just kind of like completely went back down to zero, you know, or something down there. So I was I was pretty happy with that. And uh, then when she she did her little escapade about a, about a year ago with with another penny stock and uh i said look you're on your own you open an account with the broker you buy whatever you want to buy here's the funds and i you know she saved up she had saved up this money on the side uh which she's really good at and uh she basically lost 75 80 percent of it and i said no this is not how we're gonna this is not how we're gonna trade you know we're gonna get into this and we're gonna do it the right way and so um, she went back to being full-time mom and, and I went to, to, to school, so to speak on learning everything I could find out about how this marketing, you know, how trading works. No, and I so, gotta just, I gotta just, I mean, for Ches and I, us kind of younger guys here, Ches, how terrible here we are being presumptuous about the fact of, you know, what, what, well, now I fully realize, I mean, how annoying would that be to have to call your broker once a week just to get a, a price quote? Do we not take that? so for granted right now that literally at the tip of our fingers, we can get a price quote on anything. The price quote, you know, information on a company's, you know, holdings or anything like what they do just by Google alone. So yeah, it's absolutely crazy to think about. Yeah, it's, it, it's nuts. So that's um, just something that I, I can't relate to. And I clearly, Chaz and I probably definitely take that for granted. But out of curiosity, where did your wife find this penny stock at? Oh, you know, newsletter. Somehow she got some newsletter uh, or, or it was something that she saw online and signed up for she has uh, a knack for signing up for stuff online. I was like, oh, why are you getting this email? Why are you getting all these emails? And that's that's oh, I signed up for this online, and you know, okay, you know, because she's she's uh, you know she knows our our situation, trying to get me to where uh, I'm no longer having to go to work every day, uh, work at home. Uh, like I used to do years ago when the kids were little and it's, and it's, uh, her, her heart and mind is in the right place, but the know-how, um, you know, just wasn't there. And I, I had known enough about those newsletters after experiencing a lot of them with her dad to just kind of leave them all, all alone. I just don't even bother with them. Yeah. But uh, that's that's how she probably got it was to probably okay. through the internet. So I, I like how you said that though. Her heart and mind was in the right place. And mm -hmm. uh, but you know, welcome to the club in terms of not exactly going about things the right way. Um, I'd say she's uh, in, in a club with a whole lot of members to it. So you determine, all right, you know, honey, baby, sugar cakes. I don't know what you call your wife, but we got to go about this a different way. So pick up the journey from there. What? How did you proceed? So about a year ago, you know, I, like I said, I started googling. Um, listening to a lot of the hypers, um, till I ran across some of your videos and I started, uh, watching some of your free online content and, uh, what really, uh, turned me to, you know, Clay Trader University was the fact that a lot of your videos were like, look, you, you don't have to buy my stuff, <laughs> go buy somebody's stuff, get educated. And I was like, this is exactly what I need as somebody who's like, can, can understand we, you know, we need the education, but it's not like pitching his stuff per se. Um, so, you know, I, I did a lot of research on uh, you, the company, you know, as far as the, the content, what you were offering versus what other people were offering. And uh, I just told my wife, I said, you know, we need to just dive in. It's either all or nothing if we're going to do this. And, uh, so I've got, you know, hundred percent, we're, we're a team as far as, uh, uh, how we, how we spend our funds. And, uh, so went for the CTU, got the whole package and every single day driving back and forth from work, um, 
if I had a slow minute at work or, if, you know, waking up in the morning, doing other things around the house, got, got your, got your uh, training material going on in my head. You know, we're going to the mall, we're walking around, she's shopping. I'm like listening to clay trader stuff, you know, robotic training, all the options stuff, you know, just going through every single piece of information I can get a hold of, listening to all the podcasts, listening to all the uh, free content you have on your YouTube channel. I, I've just dove into it in, in about, took me about, I would say probably three to four months of just pure listening before I even started paper trading. Now, before we go down the paper trading route here, I want the listeners to really kind of understand what Tim just said, because especially people in the chat have been driving me nuts lately, saying that I don't have time. And me and Clay hate nothing more than when people say I don't have time. So you having a 55 mile and, you know, however long it is drive, six kids, you know, a wife to take care of at home, and you are still putting in the time and putting in the effort because you know that's what it needs, you know, that's what you need to kind of succeed. So I just, I had to touch on that, Clay. I'm sorry if I took your your thunder there, but I just so many people lately have been giving me the excuse, I don't have time, and it's just such a BS excuse. Yeah, and I just and I, just to be fully transparent, and I'm, we're not just saying that just because, oh, well, Tim bought some of our stuff, so let's just, no. This is, in regard, this is anything in life. I mean, whether it's trading or you want to go into pottery or if you want to go into an apple orchard, I don't have time is just not an excuse. There's this great invention out there called the alarm clock. And uh, if you use it, believe it or not, 5 a.m., 4 a.m. does exist. Well, that means I can't stay up and watch Game of Thrones. Well, I don't know. How bad do you actually want to succeed at whatever you want to succeed at? So, yeah, to echo Chez, perfectly said. I have three kids. So when I double that, six kids, Tim, all the props to you in the world because three is, uh, there, there's quite a bit of hands full. I mean, so... Well done to you, and yeah, no excuses when it comes to I don't have time, you know. Well, you know, it's like it's like my dad is a he was an avid golfer before he got pretty much too old to golf, and we were sitting around a couple of years ago, and I was uh, I, I bought a, a big green egg, and I wanted to start smoking meat and things like that, doing real barbecue, and I would spend every weekend cooking something, you know, doing something on that egg, and. Somebody said something around the two of us, like, you know, why are you doing that? It's like, you know, if you want to learn how to do it, it takes time and you just have to give something else up. So um, with the way my schedule is at work, I, I don't really have time to watch TV. So there's nothing on good day, early morning, daytime anyway. So I might as well put something to use. And plus, my, you know, I have goals here and uh, to get out of having to drive that commute every day. So it, it's like just put the time in and every free minute it, I just um, I spend on it. it. And even now it's like I'm on I'm online, you know, looking at my trades and working my, you know, working the trading business here from sometimes eight, nine o'clock in the morning till the bell closes because uh, I don't get home till one or two o'clock in the morning. But Mondays, I purpose to get up when the bell opens. So like yesterday, I was up when the bell opens, and I'm on it all day, just grinding this out, trying to figure it out and make it work. So you just have to you just have to put time in, and it's you give up the the unimportant things, and except the bear, except the bears. Except, are you from the Chicago area? Or? I, I, I'm originally yeah. I joined the Marine Corps in uh, 1980. Uh, right out of high school, uh, from the Chicago area and came out here to California and, uh, sitting on a cliff and, uh, uh looking over the beach and I'm like, I'm never going back. <laughs> Cause I was going to say when we were talking pre, you know, interview, when I asked you where you're from, I thought for sure you're going to say someplace in the Midwest, maybe Pittsburgh, because I don't. Don't you think he sounds kind of like doc a little bit, Ches, with the way he talks and emphasizes uh, yeah, a little bit. I can see that. Yeah, so I th I thought you might have been from the Midwest, so I was shocked when you said you're out in California, but now that makes so much more sense. So anyways, I think it's a, a safe assumption that all three of us, uh, if somebody were to come up to us and say, I don't have the time, there's probably not going to be much pity um, flowing out from us. But So you're back to kind of, Ches, uh, kind of cut you off earlier before you going into paper trading, um, and cut you off in a good way, mm -hmm. Ches. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus, but yeah. where, so you... Actually, let's not even get to paper trading yet, because now the more I think, 
So what made you think, what made you want to, what even gave you the ability to just not do anything, meaning not even paper trading for those first three to four months? Because again, we talk to people all the time. I did it myself, pretty sure Ches did it, where, hey, trading is fun. I just want to get into it even while I'm learning. Let's just start trading. Let's just start paper trading. So what the heck made you think that, look, I'm not even going to paper trade for those first three to four months? Uh, I want to win. I'm a very competitive person and whatever I do, I want to be the best at it. I want to put it the best into it. So it was a matter of learning all the rules, so to speak, to the game. And if you, you know, you sit down and you play Monopoly and you don't know the rules, then, you know, it makes it hard to strategize and, you know, figure out how you're going to, you know, own the board, so to speak. So my, my thing was, if I can just really get all the different strategies down, what are all the different ways that you can play the market? Uh, you know, whether it's buying stock, selling stock, playing options, you know, the different ways to play options, you know, all these different uh markets that are out there what what is it that's going to allow me to succeed and so and yet at the same time it, i've got to find a strategy that i'm comfortable with i can't just go you know super high risk because i still you know we're going to take some capital here and we're going to invest it and uh, and i want to be able to watch it grow i want to be able to make it happen and so it was just a matter of when I going through the trading, okay, well, how do I read charts? I don't get, I don't get how to read the charts. I see all this stuff on the charts, but it doesn't make any sense. So you go through robotic training and you get that. Well, what is, what is, what does this mean when you know? How does, how do options really work? I had some basic understanding, but didn't really uh, understand it like I do now. Um, it, it, you have to go through all the material in order to get the overall picture, and then I sit down and I say, look, what am I comfortable with? And in, in as far as investing and what is going to make me the most successful and and knowing that everybody's different, I have to figure out what's good for me because I hear, you know, in your in your um, in your videos, you know, it's like, well, this works for somebody, but this doesn't necessarily work for everybody. And it's like like a lot of things that you say is like you have to be comfortable with this. You have to, it's your money. So since this is my money and I have to be comfortable with it. And I don't know all the different ways to play this. I don't want to just jump into the first thing I hear about and say, oh, this is how we're going to go. You know, I, I would do that in the beginning. Oh, this is easy. I, I got that part. And then I'd listen to somebody else and go, oh, wow, yeah, that's even better if I blend those two. Or, you know, and so the, the whole three, four months that I'm listening to all the material, I'm formulating my strategy, trying to figure out what I'm going to do that's going to allow me to be comfortable when I sit down at the computer comfortable with what the, the market's doing, comfortable with where the investments are, and yet uh, be successful at the same time. So um, that's kind of oh, where all that, that, that's why I was able to hold off on uh, before I even tried to paper trade. That's a beautiful well, answer. Yeah, and I love the fact that, you know, Tim never bought into the idea of, oh, you buy this system here. I sell you the system for, you know, $90 a month and it trades 4X, you know, every five seconds. Um, or something like that. He literally mm -hmm. from the get go kind of acknowledged that, you know, it's it's going to be a personal preference and everyone's going to be different. And at the same time, he wants to take the bird's eye view, see everything that's out there and then kind of narrow it down to what he's strong at. So so you go right. through CTU, you know, you actually, you know, you hold off practicing and everything. You see kind of essentially the whole field. Now, what exactly is sticking out to you? You know, what what is appealing out of what you've seen and learned? And, you know, where are you going to start heading and, you know, focusing your practice? Well, I, I started uh, paper trading with options and not in the uh, the day-to-day -day trading. I, I'm more of a buy the option, sell. The, uh, I'm more of an option seller, I would say. I take a credit when I do options and I just like the idea of letting time decay, just eat away at the options. And uh, to me, it's, it, it's, a, it's a conservative, but yet, at the same time, semi-aggressive, you can be aggressive, way of watching my money grow. And so, you know, I trade small. I trade uh, a variety of things. So I'm diversifying myself, keeping my risk low that way, making sure that when I go into a trade that um, I have a high probability chance of winning. And uh, I'm not so much worried about 
you know, the big dollar at the end. I'm more about consistency. And if I can, you know, win more than lose, then I know that I'll be successful in the long run. And that's kind of what I started doing with paper trading. And I paper traded for probably about two or three months because you have to go through the monthly cycle and the weekly cycles with options to do that type of trading. And you have to see how it works and kind of how it feels. And, you know, when you're when the market's moving against you, how are you going to respond to that? Um, so if it's coming against your trade, what do you do? And I had to learn those strategies uh, to be able to get out of my uh, out of harm's way, so to speak, or minimize my losses. So, you know, I did that for about two to three months, and then I started doing it with real money. So I, just I, not to not cut you off, mm -hmm. but I want to press this because this is super important. So the timeline here, people, is he bought education, and I'm just not I'm not saying my just, but any education he bought it. He did not do any of this crap where now I'm going to learn on the job and start trading with real money because I got my get out of jail free card because I invested. No, he didn't do that. Seven months later, after purchasing and investing in education, he finally went live. If you're thinking, that's like that's like over half a year. Yeah, well, that's called taking things seriously. And like Tim said, I love it. He wants to win. And if you want to win, you got to be able to understand strategy. So um, seven months, sorry to cut you off there, but there you yeah, go, no listeners. Seven months from when he invested into education to when he put his first real dollar at work. So um, seven months has gone by. You decide to start to go with real money. So let's pick it up from there. So, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just trading. Um, you know, I, I, I basically 99% of my trades are, are credit spreads uh, within the option market. Uh, very liquid uh, stocks that are... Uh, where I can get in and get out as I need to. Uh, I can make adjustments as I need to. And I just let time decay, just eat away at them. And we, you know, if you, when you, when you listen to your option courses, really you gotta go through, I was like, I'm gonna go to the option courses first. And then I went to those and I just like completely clueless. But once I got to those option courses and listening to them in order, it was, uh, it, you know, understanding the Greeks, understanding, uh, you know the level twos, understanding uh, how to read charts to to determine where a stock is going to go or not go, um, and then playing the probabilities within the option market. I, I just like the options because there's way more flexibility. And where where if you just buy a stock, it's either going to go up or down. But with options, you can you can win if it goes down, you can win if it goes up, or you can win if it goes stays the same. And that's what really appeals to me. Um, with, with each and every trade, depending on how you set it up in the first place. So if you go into the, the trade with a uh, high probability where, yeah, I may, I may think the stock's going to go up, so I play the options to where they go up, but I still give myself some room in the event that they go down. So like, for instance, yesterday, you know, the market was down yesterday and it was like, ouch, but I made absolutely no changes to any of my positions. Today, the market's in completely in my favor, and all my trades are in my in my favor, and everything's looking great. So you just have to, you know, be patient, wait for things to to manage, and that's that's a little hard for me, is to be patient. But but uh, that's you know I, I I like to just let just let the time do its thing, and uh, watch the watch the profits roll in. So everything's real small right now. I'm real conservative as far as things go. I, um, I'm not investing everything that I have as far as capital. I'm about 50% outlay right now in all my invest all my investments. But I'm each trade is very small. Um, you know, my my law. If I were to completely lose on a trade, it would not be. I, I would I would know exactly where it's at. My cap. I've got a cap loss. I've got a cap gain. But at the same time. If I lose, okay, yeah, I'm willing to lose that. It's like telling my wife, you know, 20 years ago, I'm willing to take that $500 and put a match to it because I know over here, my, all my other trades are going to make that back and then some. And I so like uh, I like that you you your real focus though is on kind of the risk. Like you're not even talking about like, oh, I know, you know, I'm just going to make a home run on one of these and then I'll be good to go. It's that you know, if the worst thing was to happen, 
you know, my, my losses are capped, you know, I'm, I'm set to go. And, you know, like you said, time is your friend, small, mm -hmm. you know, small amounts of capital and high occurrences. That's what you want. You're spread around the market. Um, that's the kind of way to do it long term. So, you know, a one up move or one down move doesn't completely kill you. So I love that. I love hearing that. Um, and I, this is going to be a little bit more technical. So some of the newer listeners might not understand it, but I promise you um, it will make a little bit more sense. But I want to know how much do you actually utilize your kind of technical analysis skills prior to putting on positions? Because there are methodologies where, you know, people can strictly look at the Greeks and kind of form trade ideas without using, you know, support resistance, trend lines, anything like that. Um, are you utilizing technical analysis kind of heavily in your trading? Are you using Greeks? Are you using them kind of a mixed bag? You know, what, is, what does that look like for you kind of to formulate what, when a, a trade looks good for you? I, I use both. I use technical analysis and I use the Greeks. Um, when I'm using technical analysis, like I'll look at a chart, you know, for example, I'll just pull up, you know, SPY as an example. I've got the Bollinger Bands on. I've got the 100, uh, excuse me, the 50 and the 200 SMAs going. And uh, and then I've got a 13 SMA in here as well for short-term stuff. But I'll look at that. I'll look at, you know, is the market overextended, underextended? I'm looking at, uh, you know, my RSIs, implied uh, volatility, where is that at? How's that moving in the stock market? So I'm using a lot of technical analysis there, and then I go, okay, now this stock I can kind of see where it's going to go or or where it's trending, and then I'll go to uh, the option market and I'll look at that stock and I'll say, is there any money here? Because a lot of times you'll look at a stock and you'll say, oh, the spreads are completely killer they're 20 points apart i can't do anything here you know whereas if you get something that's liquid and has narrow spreads then you can say all right now it's a matter of is the risk reward going to be worth it so if the if the spreads are small and the uh, and there's money to be made then where i where i've got the probabilities at i'm comfortable then i'll go for it and so that's uh that's pretty much my my method of how I walk through that. I first look at the chart. I look at all the indicators. I determine uh, how that stock's going to go, and then uh, I go look at my probabilities and see if there's any you know if the spreads are tight and uh, and if the probabilities are in my favor and there's there's money to be made there yet at the same time hedging myself so I don't want to you know uh, have an unlimited loss. I always have something capped so that. Uh, with my, you know, basically working with my option spreads and then I'll put the trade on and then it's just a matter of just sitting and waiting. And more often than not, I'm right because I, I use all of that to make that decision. It just takes a little while. You know? It takes a little while, but you're definitely going about it. And, um, you know, I, I think back and there's always, you know, people that show up in the chat room or just show up in emails or whatever. And yeah, I, you know, I've been trading, I got it all figured out. And then they just start talking and chirping and chirping and you just sit back and say you know the, no you do not no you sorry buddy you, you you have nothing figured out but Chez, i don't know about you but his whole explanation of how he goes about things that sounds like somebody that knows what they're doing like if they just showed up in the chat room and started talking about all that stuff i would say hey welcome to the club i i don't think you need any sort of education at all it sounds like you got a good grasp on everything yeah, you got a good grasp on it. You're going about it the right way. You practice kind of your entries. You know your criteria, and you know what you're looking for. Yeah, and I love uh, I love how you take. Um, you're kind of a pessimist, it seems. You, what's the worst case scenario? None of this crap about. Well, what's the best case scenario? How much could I make here? If that's your approach to a trade, you're doing it the wrong way. You need to be kind of in the pessimist mind point of what's the worst that could happen. So I love how you have everything capped. Uh, you know, that's just a beautiful thing. Out of curiosity. Uh, you're what we would call an options farmer in the community, somebody that mm -hmm. just, you know, plants fields and, you know, or plants their seeds. And then as their crops, you know, come about, you know, they're just going to harvest the crop over time. So, uh, to go along with that analogy, how long does it take your seeds from, you know, planting those seeds to starting to harvest those crops? I mean, is this happening in a, a few days, a few weeks, what sort of time frames are you, are you looking at? Um, I play two different types of options. I'll play the weeklies. Uh, just to kind of more or less, I, I don't want to say practice, uh, but with the weeklies, you know, seven to nine days out, uh, I'll play those type of markets. I'll put a few trades on just to kind of like 
okay, how am I doing? Is the strategy working? And see how that kind of works. But really what I, the majority of my stuff is in the monthlies. So like right now I'm waiting for October 21 and I got a lot of stuff that's coming due then. And I'm just, you know, managing those trades on a day-to-day basis. And then in the meantime, while that's happening, you know, I'm looking at, wow, can this stock do anything here in the next seven days? Can this earn me something here in 14 days? Uh, And so I'll look at those options. And if I see something that that can, you know, make a little money between now and next Friday, then uh, I'll put that on. Um, But otherwise, like, I I just come in here every morning. I look at where my each and every one of my trades is at. Am I do I need to make an adjustment? If not, you know, wait till the bell rings. I might jump in the chat room, say hi to everybody. But uh, I mean, I'm in the chat room every day. I just don't talk a lot because it's, you know, it's it's work to me. Uh, this is my job. And so if I've got a minute, sure, you know, like you do at any job, you might say hi to everybody. But otherwise, you know, I'm managing trades, looking for something that's going to make a few hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars there uh, for next week. And that's kind of how I play the, the options there. So it sounds like you have both short-term crops and then you have longer-term crops that take a, a while. But just for reference point, when he says um, October 21st, this is being recorded at the end of September. So those longer-term crops, those are still about three weeks out. Um, right. Because when you as listeners listening to this, it'll seem super close. But you know, at the time of this recording, he's looking at about uh, you know three weeks to about four weeks out. Now, let's talk about losses because I'm curious. A lot of times, as we've already noted, we talk with people, they start off strong, then they do something and it just totally, you know, they lose a bunch of money or whatever. But it seems like you never really had any sort of losses or necessarily struggled with that. Uh, but have you had any losses since you started? Uh, and just how do you mentally deal with that? Do you go into like, do you throw a pity party for yourself? Do you automatically think you're a terrible trader? How exactly do you deal with that from a psychological perspective and then move on from it? Uh, no, I, I have had some losses. Um again, we're talking about probabilities and I, I try to, to play somewhere between 75 and 80% chance of winning. So what, you know, there's that other 25, 20, 25% chance of losing. I did have, uh, my, my worst loss was Amazon totally went against me. I, I woke up, you know, got dressed, came in here, sat down, started going through my trades and Amazon had just blown through uh, I, I had an iron condor on and Amazon blew through the top half of that And I just sat there and I just go, well, this is going to cost me. But I knew exactly what my loss was going to be. I'd already calculated that when I entered the trade. So I I knew what my loss was going to be. I had already had that tolerance built in. And because I had played both sides of that uh, particular trade, you know, it was a net net of stock being assigned to me. And then I had to, you know, then it, then it got sold. So I had a gross loss of a thousand dollars, but then with all the, uh, the credits that I'd taken in, it really only came down to about a 600, $650 loss, you know, and that's $650 is $650. I don't want to do, you know, demean that amount, but my tolerance was that I was willing to accept that loss on that particular trade when I put it on. So, I felt that and I just sat there and went, okay, well, I was wrong. Get over it. Let's move on. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, you land on boardwalk, pay the bill and let's keep going. I'm not out of money yet. <laughs> so Yeah, pay pay um, that rent, pay that hotel room. But, the, you know, yep. especially if you're right 80% of the time, um, obviously those one times hurt, but what I like to hear is that you didn't say, you know, well, I, I went back into Amazon with double the size or triple the size and I'm going to get that sucker back, you know, like revenge trading, just like you said, um, you know, you look at it, you took the loss, you know, the odds, you know what you're, you pretty much capped losses and you just move along. And it really all still goes back to the, what you said about you're trading small and you have it spread across many different places. So it's not like you're sitting here telling us, yeah, well, this one time, I put 80% of my account in Amazon and then something crazy happened and then I lost, you know, a whole lot of money. I mean, no, I, you're, you're, yeah, you're, exactly. that's why small and spread around. I want to keep reiterating that when you're doing these, this options farming type stuff, that's the key. Small positions, but you have a bunch of them sprinkled out across the market. That way, if something crazy happens, because there's no holy grail system, people are going to be wrong. 
Tim was wrong in this situation, uh, but it's not like it sent him to the poorhouse. Exactly. And, and it's, and, you know, so not only am I spread across different stocks, different type of you know, underlings, but I'm also uh, across various different sectors. So, you, you know, you, it's Good like, point. okay, well, you, you don't want to just be in technology per se, or just in bio or just in, you know, uh, oil and gas. You want to be in a variety of different things because, you know, I'm looking at the market today. Some things are up, some things are down. Um, you know, tomorrow it's going to be a flip, <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, you, got, you got to be aware of correlation for sure. Exactly. So that I, every time I sit down and I look at a trade, it's like, okay, well, am I already in this? If I'm going to do something with Chevron, why would I do something with BP, you know, or vice versa? Uh, let me, let me look at some other industry, see where I can get at. All right. So, good to be, good to be kind of spread around like that. Now, something I want to kind of to touch on here though is obviously you've been you know like you said you accept your losers you know what your probabilities are you know what your losses are so we got your risk covered we know your kind of entry criteria we mm -hmm. know kind of some of the indicators you use um but what personally do you think you need to work on right now what would you say is the one thing you're striving to kind of improve in your trading and kind of what would you say is your biggest pitfall at the moment my my biggest pitfall is just not being patient long enough to let that let that plant grow, so to speak. Um, which, a after now being in real money for about six, four to six weeks, let's see, I started a, probably the third or fourth week of August. So, what am I? I'm in about five or six weeks now. It, it's yep. oh my gosh, the stock's going up. I got it, and it's moving against me. I got to do something. In reality, I just need to just leave it alone and trust my initial analysis because I I'm coming to learn that the that the that the risk and the um, and the analysis on the front end I'm right more than I'm wrong and if I just trust in the charts trust in the indicators trust in the probabilities and just let it ride out just sit back like yesterday I told myself you're not allowed to trade we're just gonna sit here and manage anything that just blows up nothing blew up so i walked away without doing anything um that that kind of trading and letting you know the crops grow so to speak is is really where i need to just kind of focus uh that's where i'm really putting my effort right now and in, in handcuffing myself from i gotta do something every day i don't have to do something every day um, you know, today everything looks great except Google. So what am I going to do? But Google's not in a position where I need to, to do anything. It's just not, I'm just not as happy with it as I'd like it to be. So realize that one o'clock when the bell rings my time, go to work and come back tomorrow and do it all again. And so being patient with, uh, and trusting my analysis and trusting, uh, you know, what I've learned and putting into practice the, the tools that uh, I've acquired over the past seven, eight months, trusting those things and putting them into practice is, uh, is kind of where I'm really putting my focus at right now. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I want to circle back to this just because this, we discovered this for full disclosure. This is not just some sort of on the spot discovery here, but you mentioned that you did some negotiating with your boss at work. Uh, and this just circles back to the whole concept of, I mean, you're taking this serious, you know, I don't have time. It's not an excuse. So are, are you able to talk about that here? Sure. Can you, okay. Sure. Yeah. Talk about what you, what you negotiated with your boss. And, um, cause I was just like, oh, that's, that was a great time manipulation move on your part. Well, I, I work at a hospital. I'm an IT guy. So I sit in the basement, uh, you know, eight, eight, eight hours a day. And anybody who's lived out here in the LA area, you know, our, our traffic is uh, notorious. So, you know, I would spend two hours a morning, two hours in the evening uh, getting to and from work. So I'm spending 12 hours out of 24-hour day work-related. And that really put a strain on the family. About three years ago, some things happened with it, within my family uh, that I needed to make a change and be available for some other things in the, in the morning. So I, I just went to my boss and I said, look, you know, we're a, we're a hospital my team, yeah, can I work a different shift? Can I work second shift? Uh, so I, I don't have to be to work now till three o'clock, um, which is perfect because, uh, you know, 
I, I made that change originally for another reason, but as we started, my wife and I started investigating in how we're going to do trading and all this stuff. It's just like, well, that's beautiful because here in California, the market opens at 6.30, closes at 1 o'clock. I got to leave at 1 o'clock, 1.30 anyway. Uh, it cut down my commute. Uh, it's, you know, so I'm not doing two hours each way. I'm down to 55 to 65 minutes each way now because there's no tra traffic at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and it works out perfect for trading. So I, I get a little sleep. I get up, I get on it. It's uh, I, I look at it as a as a part time job right now to hopefully one day move it into a full time position. So uh, every morning, five days a week, my wife knows Fridays is option options expire. So let's you know leave me alone. Thursday's adjustment day if I need to. Uh, Mondays I'm on it you know at the, as the market opens because Mondays are just a little crazier. Uh, I don't like to wake up to surprises on a Monday. Plus, I can get a little rest on the weekends to be able to do that. So it, it's working out really well for me right now as far as timing goes. Um, well, what I like about it, though, is it's not like luck of the draw or anything. You grabbed the bull by the horns, and you went and made this time happen for you. I mean, you've worked things around in your schedule. Now you, I love how... You know, my wife knows op Fridays, leave me alone because options expire. Thursdays are adjustment. I mean, you like have it mapped out day by day. But Alyssa, a lot of this had to do with you just going and being proactive with your boss. So for you listeners out there, well, I work, you know, I don't know, go talk to your boss. If you're a good worker, I I'm willing to bet that your boss may be willing to uh, negotiate a little bit with you on flexibility so that maybe you can get yourself in front of the computer more for those prime trading hours. So I've, that, that's, that's no excuses when it comes to time. Be a Tim, okay, out there. Be an early dog. Go out there and make things happen. And um, yeah, this is this is. You are a man with a plan. That's really kind of the the only way I can summarize that up. So, looking at the time here, we got to start to close things out. We will definitely have to have you back though, for sure. Uh, sure. But Chez has a time machine, and Chez is also out in California. So it would be just he could probably throw it in the U-Haul, and it's not going to be that expensive to ship it up to you. So if he were to give you that time machine, and you could go back to I don't know. I'll let you define the start. Um, what would be the one bit of advice you'd give yourself? Uh, I, I wish I'd have done this about five, six years ago. <laughs> I'd we go all back say that. And, start and, sooner. And, I love it. Yeah, start sooner is, is really, um, you know, it was something that I've always had an interest in, but it, it just, we had a lot of things happening uh, in my personal life that didn't afford for it. But, uh, you know, uh, Things have settled down. Things are in a good place. So uh, I'm making it happen. So starting sooner is pretty much where it would be at for me. Well, I, I would just want to echo Clay that uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. And it's great to you know have another interview with some more options farmers. Uh, you know, we primarily have a lot of guests who kind of do directional stuff mainly. But um, the option farming is an absolutely awesome strategy. I'm a huge fan of it myself and utilize it in uh, a good portion of my trading too. But Let's move on to Clay's most important question here. And mm -hmm. what will determine if we're going to even air your podcast at all is what is your favorite movie? The number one movie. I, I've heard everybody's favorite movies. You guys have all missed it. The number one movie Ooh, of I all like time. This. Confidence. Is, is the Blues Brothers. I mean, that is one of the most classic movies of all time. We've got all those cameos. Uh, and and uh, I was always a big Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi fan from their Saturday Night Live days. But the the you know being from Chicago, uh, I saw that movie when I was in the Marine Corps in, in a movie theater full of Marines, and there was about eight of us that were laughing through the whole movie because we were all from Chicago. We got all the jokes. But uh, even if you don't get all the jokes, it's it's just one of the go back and watch it. The you know the the musicians, the you know. Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles. You, you just can't can't go wrong with that movie. And it's funny as all get out too. It's a great it's a great comedy. I've never so. seen it, but with your just straight up authority, you gave us an authoritative candle right there. You said bar none, the best movie. And so I we'll have to check that one out for sure. What about Clay, Clay Wise? Clay, you, you won't go back to what you're used to after you watch that movie. I'll Ooh, just put it I, to I, you like that. It watch. really is a classic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my, my favorite food is uh, by by far, and I told my wife uh, I was going to say this on the podcast. She has this dish. It's we we call it magic melting beef, and uh, it 
it, we call it that because it, it's a it's a beef dish that she braises in a wine sauce for hours in the oven, and then we pour it over mashed potatoes with the sauce, and you eat it with a spoon. The the beef just comes apart with a spoon. What, what time's dinner? I'm I might hop on a plane and uh, be out there tonight. Well, it, it, I'll, I'll send you an email when the Christmas Eve party is because we <laughs> definitely have it on that. <laughs> well, Chaz, I'm spending Christmas but, Eve in uh, California. Yeah, she it looks it like three or four times. A year. Yeah, yeah, come on over. So yeah, make room for Clay and myself. But yeah, my my wife actually makes something very similar where it just kind of falls apart, and like you said, you just kind of it. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, but, it's uh, just, it's just a braised beef, and it's just amazing. It's now, what do you do for fun or hobbies kind of outside the market? With six kids, I'm sure they, they keep you pretty active when you're home. Um, when we are all home, which is, uh, which is rare, I've got, you know, four of them are in college, three of them locally here, but uh, one's, one's away. So, I mean, when we're together, it's, it's go to the beach. Uh, the beach is, you know, here, I, we're down in South Orange County, so those beaches are amazing. And anywhere where there's surfing or boogie boarding or and sharks. You know, body surfing now there's no there's no whatever there's i don't want to hear shark. it. there are sharks it's... all over the place uh, surfers yeah. surfers are like seals they just bring in the sharks like <laughs> oh no that's that's the least of our worries it's we're not in new jersey or we're not in san francisco so <laughs> you know if you're surfing up there in the at mavericks you might see a few sharks but down here where we are trestles and whatnot there's there's no sharks it's just all waves Hey it's Chess, where's Tim? Oh, he got he's in the hospital because he just lost both legs <laughs> into a shark attack. That's next week is probably gonna happen. Anyway, <laughs> good stuff. No, I always give my sister a hard time who's out in somewhere in California. I'm like, I can't believe you're going swimming with all those sharks and it drives you nuts. There are no sharks out here because they're up in the cold water, but I'm still gonna give her a bunch of crap about it. But uh yeah. last question here. Three words, and they have to be associated with what you would believe or what you would associate, I should say, with a successful trader. So what would those three words be? Do your analysis. I like that. That's, That's good. Cool. Bam. Take, take the time, take the time on the front end. A lot of people think, you know, that you, you know, the, the win is on the back end, but it's really not. If you do your analysis, uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of trading. I mean, I watch your your webinars and, and what you're doing. It's all about the it's all about the front end. Uh, regardless of the type of trading you're doing, you, you'll win on the back end if you do the work on the front end. So yeah, the money, uh, yeah, there's and the saying in real estate goes on a real estate deal, which I, I do invest in real estate. You make mm -hmm. money when you buy, not when you sell. And right. uh, the same exact principle holds true here. I fully agree there in, in trading. You're, you're making your money on the analysis up front, not on the back end. So uh, yeah, good, good. Nice way to end because you're absolutely right. And uh, that certainly applies to a lot of things in life, but definitely trading and definitely real estate investing. Well, Tim, would you ever come back? Because I, I feel like we'll definitely yeah. have to have you back at some point in time. Excellent, excellent. Maybe yeah. even have your wife join us because she, she, it seems like she's got quite a passion for this stuff too. So my, it, we could be breaking ground with a husband and wife, but I don't need a yes or no answer at this point in time. But she she doesn't get the trading at all, but she understands the concepts. So, but but you know we do everything as a team, so. I do like that. And that could be an interesting interview in and of itself. How to how to work with your with your mate when and approaching the market. I don't know. We'll have to put our heads together. But in all seriousness, yeah. thank you very much for uh, sure. taking time out of your day and hanging out with us. Uh, a lot of thank great you. nuggets of wisdom here. Appreciate appreciate you guys having me on. For you listeners out there, a few things before we all part ways. If you're listening on YouTube, check out the channel as a whole. And there's a lot of other videos besides these podcasts, live trade videos, chart analysis videos, quick tip videos, all sorts of stuff. So definitely check out the channel. If you're listening on the website, claytrader.com, click that share button, leave us a comment. We do read those and we will reply. And then finally, if you're listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, especially on iTunes, if you could leave us a, a rating, that would be very much appreciated. It just helps get the word out. And, um, you know, it just lets Ches and I know that people are finding these valuable and, you know, it, it's worth everybody's time. So if you could do those small little things, like I said, it would be greatly appreciated. So thanks again to Tim. Thank you again to all you listeners out there. We'll see you back for the next episode. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.